What if Toyota and Subaru finally made a recall for the excess RTV issue? I'm here to tell you why you wouldn't want the dealership to perform this recall anyway, and also a glimpse into what this recall might look like. Gen 2 owners, stay tuned and find out right now. For you guys who have been with the channel for a while now, you guys know that we have been early front runners in trying to document and solve, along with the community, the excess RTV issues plaguing the FA24, specifically in the new Gen 2 chassis, the GR86 and the BRZ. Very early on, owners were asking dealerships, what's up with this RTV issue? Should I be concerned? And I'll give the dealerships credit. No one really knew what the problems were, what the outcomes were going to be, you know, what was Toyota Subaru's official response to the RTV issue. With that being said, a lot of early owners went to dealerships and asked the dealers, hey, can you drop my oil pan and clean the oil strainer? I've heard about this RTV issue. I think majority of dealers declined. Majority of them said like, no, don't worry about it. This is not an issue. We had one local customer take his GR86 to a local Toyota dealer. And again, this was very early on and he actually convinced the dealer to remove the oil pan and do an oil strainer cleaning for him. Sounds good, right? No, <laughs> absolutely not. And you'll find out right now. So in this instance, the customer pretty much pleaded with the dealer like, hey, I'm really concerned about this. I really want you guys to do the RTV cleaning for me. And so finally, after some back and forth negotiation, the dealership buckled and they said, okay, we will do it for $1,200 parts and labor. So fast forward, they did it, right? They dropped the oil pan and cleaned the oil strainer. At least that's what they said. They would not let the customer have any pictures that, you know, the customer requested like, hey, can I have before and after pictures of what you guys found in the oil strainer? The customer claimed that the service advisor only showed him pictures on the, on the computer, but would not let him keep any of the pictures. Ended up parts and labor, the dealer charged him around $900. So less than what they quoted him. A lot of money, a lot more than we charge, but you know, better than that $1,200 estimate they initially gave, right? Wrong. So next oil change interval, he decided to contact us to do the lube oil filter service, basically an oil and filter change. He had no idea about our RTV inspection. So I explained to him, you know, we offer this complimentary inspection for Gen 2 owners. We look at the old oil, we put a boroscope inside the lower oil pan and look around the crankcase. If there's any issues, we also cut open the oil filter, look between the pleats, see if there's any evidence of excess RTV in the engine. All complimentary for Gen 2 owners. And he was like, okay, cool. Sounds like a good idea. Here's what happens. So this was early last year. It doesn't look like we found any RTV in the drained out oil, but the Biggest concern for us was putting a boroscope inside the engine and we'll overlay some pictures right now. We actually found scraped off strings of old RTV. So how does this happen, right? The lower oil pan does not have a gasket. It's sealed with RTV. And so you have to scrape off the old stuff, right? You remove the oil pan, there's RTV left over. So you are literally using a scraper tool or a razor blade against the metal surfaces of both the engine and the oil pan. You have to scrape all the old RTV off and then get it clean so that when you lay down the new RTV, it's a clean sealing surface. Otherwise, it's not gonna seal. What appeared to happen was that there was insufficient cleanup by the tech who did this job. Basically, he was scraping the upper oil pan and either left the old scraped strings of RTV on there I, yeah, I, that's the only thing I can think that would happen. And you can see by the pictures, that's exactly what it looked like when you scrape off, you know, these string cheese looking strings of RTV remain. And uh, if you don't clean up well enough, they kind of hang out there just like what's pictured. So yeah, multiple long strings of scraped old RTV due to insufficient cleanup. The next thing, the amount of RTV used to seal the lower oil pan was even greater than factory for a 2022. And yeah, we will overlay the pictures and you can see. So for manufacture date 2022, you can find the manufacture date on the inside door dam. It'll say MFD and then it'll say basically two digit code, that's the month, and then a four digit code, that's the year. So manufacture date 2022 from the factory, they were still using the dark gray RTV 
on the lower oil pan and they were using way too much of it. But the technician who worked on this car put an even excessive amount than was previously on the oil pan from the factory. Next part of our RTV inspection, we cut open the oil filter. Guess what we found? Pieces of dark gray silicone in all the oil filter pleats. Evidence of insufficient cleanup as usually the filter should be clean at the second oil change. So yeah, again, whatever method you're scraping RTV, worst case scenario, the tech used either a electric or a air power drill tool with a wire brush and basically brushed the bottom of the engine to get the RTV off. And if you can imagine with a pneumatic tool, it's basically spraying the old RTV everywhere. Common sense would tell you this is the wrong way to do it. When you're using a tool like that, you're getting old RTV everywhere inside the underside of the engine. Common sense would tell you this, but I'll tell you guys later why under the pay scale that technicians get at the dealership, you know, who, who cares if it gets dirty or not, right? Or who cares if I do the job right or not? So long story short, due to insufficient cleanup from removing the old RTV that was on the engine, all the old RTV bits that were scraped off or whatever wire wheeled off, they ended up in the oil filter. Terrible because all that junk has to run through the engine first before it ends up in the oil filter. So I keep saying there's internal filters in the cam carriers on these FA chain engines. So imagine all the little RTV particles, they can get trapped not only internally in oil passages, but especially in those fine filters that are inside the cam carriers on a FA engine. Customer was told the oil strainer cleaning was done using OEM procedures. But what procedure? It is about two years later, as of filming this, in two more days, it'll be 2024, two years later. We still don't have a TSB. There's still nothing in the service manual outlining how to clean the oil strainer. There's no service bulletin. So what procedure is the dealership talking about? Cleaning the oil strainer is not an easy job. I use three different pick tools to get inside the five sided oil strainer to, in order to clean it out. And basically I'll look in there with a flashlight, gently pick out as much as I can because the oil pickup tube is all plastic constructed. And if that guy gets damaged, that's a huge deal because the front timing cover has to come off to change the oil pickup tube on the FA24. So very gently pull out as much RTV as I can. I'll usually spray a gentle solvent to try to get stuff to, you know, migrate down and um, after I feel like it's as clean as I can get it you know we'll call it good but I basically have three different shape pick tools one I custom made and the only purpose for those three picks is for RTV cleaning on a FA24. Again back to the issue all these fine RTV residue pieces we found inside the oil filter and why if you were unfortunately a dealer tech why you wouldn't care how well you cleaned up or by what method you cleaned the old RTV off. Let's talk about the dealership flat rate system. So under the flat rate system, you are paid by how fast you do a job, not how well you do it. There's no incentive to do quality work. Rushing a job out and cutting corners is rewarded. Dealer technicians are paid in a, let's say, interesting way. We are not paid hourly. So I clock in and uh, work an hour. I don't get my regular wage. Laws will change state by state. Out here in California, there's this like complicated way you get paid now. But long story short, if I clock in and work an hour, that doesn't guarantee I get paid my regular wage. It's probably been five or seven, let's call it seven years since I worked at the dealership. But there was a time at the dealership where you could literally work a eight hour day and produce work and get paid zero dollars an hour. How does that work? Again, clock in, you're not paid hourly, right? One way that's easy to describe it as is a commission with no base pay. So let's say I get dispatched a job, right? We're gonna do front brake pads and rotors on this R32 Skyline. No problem, so I do the job. The job pays one hour, but I'm very good at my job, right? So I get the job done in half an hour. So in half an hour, I made one hour's worth of what's called flagged time, right? So even though I only worked half an hour, I got paid for you know an hour's worth of work. Sounds kind of dishonest, right? Well, that's the good way it works and majority of the time it does not work the good way and here's an example I get this car it has wheel lock key can't find the wheel lock key so now here's where I burn time I look in the car can't find it talk to the service advisor hey does the customer have the wheel lock key I can't find it in the car of course 
I get talk back from him, right? Like, what do you mean you can't find it? Are you stupid? Did you look in the glove box? Did you look in the trunk? And here, here I am already burning time, um, getting disrespected by someone in the shop, or I should say the, the service advisor. And I have to explain, no, I looked through the car and I can't find it. Now he's got to call the customer. Hopefully the customer will tell us, yeah, it's in this secret cubby, right? And then, yeah, now I can finally take the wheels off and do what I was supposed to do in the first place, right? Do the brakes. All this time, if you can imagine, half an hour may have elapsed. I am doing my job, but I do not get paid for that half an hour. Again, commission with no base pay. Let's give another example. The rotor is seized onto the hub because it's rusty, right? So I do the right thing. I spray PB blaster, I heat up the rotor, I use a puller that's going to properly separate the rotor from the hub without damaging the wheel bearing or anything else. And I may have burned an hour because the rotor was rusted onto the hub. Who pays for that hour? And realistically, the customer should pay, right? Like, hey, I need, I need extra labor time because there was this unforeseen issue with the car that already existed. In reality, what happens is you eat the time. And usually a tech doesn't wanna to go to the service advisor because the service advisor will say like, hey, your coworker wouldn't have asked me this. He would have just taken off the rotor or, or like, no, it, it wasn't that hard to take off. You're just being selfish and asking for more time. Or, you know, another excuse is like, I can't call the customer for that. They're going to completely decline. And they're never going to come back. So I ate an hour. So now, you know, let's just say I only had to fight one of the rotors. A job that only pays book time one hour. I have spent two hours on this job. What does that mean? So I have worked two hours, but I only get paid my one hour hourly wage. Long story short, as a dealer technician, you, you almost always lose under the flat rate system, unless you play some games. Remember, rushing a job out and cutting corners is rewarded. Let me give you some examples. And we'll use the RTV cleaning as a specific example, right? Again, it does not pay for me to do this job correctly. It, it pays for me to goop on the RTV and kick this car out because that's how I can get the car out as fast as possible. If I can just spray the crap out of the inside of that oil strainer and if there's a little bit more RTV in there, whatever, I did my best. I'm just gonna call it a, and uh, again, I'm trying to kick this car out as fast as I can to make my labor hours. Or even the worst case, I'm gonna pull in the car, I'm gonna clock on on the computer, and then I'm gonna put the car back out, or I'm gonna write on the repair order that removed oil pan, cleaned oil strainer, done. But actually not do the work. And believe it or not, this happens. I used to work with a guy, on major services, you do the engine and the cabin air filter. On some Subaru, legacies, it would be a little bit of an annoyance to change the cabin filter because it was under the dash and then there was like 12 of these like screw clips that were annoying. And instead of being like, this is the annoying cabin filter, when he would get his parts for the service, he'd take the cabin filter and just throw it in the trash. Amazing, right? But again, rushing a job out and cutting corners is rewarded. So what's really rewarded, right, to get the job as fast as possible is to not do the job at all. Let's just throw it away, right? Another issue with the flat rate system, customer pay time versus warranty time. So really simple, if the car is under warranty, the technician will get paid a predetermined warranty time. Again, oil strainer cleaning. If a customer is paying out of pocket, they're going to get billed the book time, let's just say three hours. If the car is still under warranty and there is a recall, right? So let's just, for example, Toyota has a factory recall for excess RTV in the strainer. And the recall repair is for you to drop the oil pan and clean the strainer. For this recall, the technician will get paid half of his wage. Why does this happen? I don't know why this happens, but you know, I, I watched a video about the flat rate system and it's one thing he mentioned was that it's really messed up that if there is a factory defect with the car, almost everyone wins except for the technician. The technician gets paid half his wage to fix a manufacturer defect while everyone else wins, right? The customer wins because they get their car fixed. The car company wins because the customer feels good. Like, oh, you know, the car company recognized there was this defect with their car and then my car got fixed for free, right? So customer wins, car company wins. Everyone else at the dealership wins. The service advisor gets his wage. I think service riders get paid differently. 
at every dealership, whether it's like how much book time they can bill, how many repair orders they write, I'm not quite sure, but they're certainly not getting paid half their wage to write up a warranty repair. And then everyone else, right? The dealership wins because the warranty time, basically, I believe the car company will pay the dealership the warranty time. All the hourly employees, so like the cashier, the car washers, the parts person who pulls the parts, everyone else wins except for the technician because I'm getting paid half my wage. Why is this? So here I am, I get dispatched a work order for the RTV recall and it sucks because I'm getting paid 1.5 hours for a job that I should be getting paid three hours for. What does this mean? It gives the technician less incentive to perform a repair correctly because we are losing money on the job. Here's a job that's difficult to do. It's labor intensive. It's intensive on my body. I'm probably gonna breathe in two cans of brake clean and, and swallow in how much like oil and RTV. Did I mention I'm getting paid half my wage? What incentive do you have for me to do this job correctly? Why shouldn't I just half-ass it and kick this car out the door? And so this is exactly what happens. You pay someone half their wage and tell them like, you need to do this job correctly. And why? <laughs> why? After all my experience, all my training, for me to do a job that requires technical knowledge, what incentive do you have for me to do this correctly? Flat rate system rewards for speed, not accuracy or level of completeness of a job. So again, because the oil pickup sits so closely to the bottom of the lower oil pan, we cannot get the probe directly inside the oil pickup and look at the strainer. That would be most ideal, right? But again, what we did find was that insufficient cleanup inside the crankcase, as well as evidence inside the oil filter we cut open. We can assume that the tech rushed out this job. Obviously he didn't do a complete enough job cleaning, but again, he's not paid to do a good job on this car. In fact, he's getting paid half his wage to do this job that sucks. You know, unfortunately, it's not the right thing, but I can see why he did it under those conditions. That's, I mean, that's the, the dealership life, right? Again, I have in my notes, can cheat the system by not completing the TSB at all and collecting the labor hours for it. Okay, so here's an interesting story. The most experience at a dealer I have is with Subaru. I worked at two different Subaru dealers for about four years and we get recalls all the time, right? Safety related or not. Let's do a safety one. The seatbelt recall on the later 2000s Foresters, there was a seatbelt recall where basically uh, you replaced all the back seatbelts. The job sucks, it didn't pay that well. And you know, my mindset with these recalls or TSBs was like, okay, well, I'm gonna lose money on the first one, you know, read the instructions, torque everything to spec, go step by step down the instructions, uh, make sure I understand everything. And like, I'll lose money on the first couple, but then, you know, once I do enough of these recalls, I can at least, at least break even, right? That's normally not the mindset. Usually what happens, unfortunately, is you get the parts and then you basically just shotgun it. You throw the seatbelts in and say, okay, I'm good. Guess what happened? A lot of these seatbelts didn't get put in correctly, right? But that's the real world. Again, flat rate system rewards for speed, not accuracy or level of completeness of the job. So if I don't understand how to do this safety recall or I'm getting paid half of my wage, why am I gonna print out the instructions and thoroughly look at them, follow them step by step, torque everything to spec, double check, function check after I'm done? Why would I do any of this if I'm getting paid half my wage under the flat rate system? And I, I saw this all the time. And one thing that's not often talked about is as the service department, I know so many managers I've had have really put forward to us like, oh, we're a team, right? The service department is not a team. We're all contractors. So every dealer tech is a contractor. When you get dispatched work, it's like you get dispatched a contract job as a contractor. So you might get some jobs that are difficult and don't pay very well, or you might get some jobs that are relatively simple and pay well, just like the real world contractors. Recalls, just like our imaginary RTV recall, typically don't pay well. Again, you're getting paid half your wage. JO2 valve spring recall is a perfect example. We're gonna boil it down. There was a recall to replace valve springs if you had like an Impreza or, you know, most notably a uh, FRS or BRZ. And there were so many examples of your engine blew up after the recall was performed. Again, flat rate system, let's go back. Here, the JO2 valve spring recall, the engine had to come out of the car and apart. It's a big job. If the engine's gotta come out of the car, it's a big job. So the engine's gotta come out of the car, come apart, cleaned up, 
replace valve springs, you gotta clean everything perfectly and then reseal it, put the engine back in, you know, add all the fluids, bleed everything, road test it, function check, I'll make sure everything's okay. And I'm getting paid half my wage for all of this. So if you guys can imagine, that's exactly why a lot of these engines failed. Why am I gonna look through the instructions to see how to do this recall correctly? Why am I gonna, why am I gonna go the extra step? and go beyond the recall. Remove the oil pan and see if there's any excess RTV from when I cleaned up or, you know, the, this engine has a hundred thousand miles on it. And this is what happened to a lot of these JO2 cars. Maybe old RTV or old stuff from the car having a hundred thousand miles would block the oil strainer and starve the engine of oil. Nobody's paying me to go the extra step to make sure that this job is done correctly or that this engine will last for the customer. No one's paying me to go the extra step. And as a matter of fact, I'm getting paid half my wage to do this recall anyway. And so that's exactly what we saw. Whether it was the technician's fault that foreign stuffs were blocking the oil strainer and starving the engine of oil, excess RTV when the engine was sealed back together and that causing problems, basically not following the outline procedure of how much and where you should be applying RTV. I've seen a lot of these xj02 cars in person and yeah all them majority of them are terrible it's like i hate to say it but it's like a little kid using a hot glue gun and being like right with the rtv another technical note oem rtv needs 24 hours of cure time to seal properly what that means uh room temperature vulcanizing right so basically at room temperature the rtv which technically comes out as a liquid it'll harden to be kind of like a semi-solid right so it needs to completely harden in order to be able to resist deflection right if the engine's flexing and most importantly to resist fluid leakage right so coolant oil dealer techs cannot wait for rtv to cure due to flat rate system yeah all the time you know i do i remember being at the dealer we do like warranty oil pan or transmission pan reseals dude the customer's waiting in the lobby i need to get this car done in an hour plus i'm getting paid uh, half my rate so this warranty trans pan reseal plus refilling the trans plus you may have to use the scan tool afterwards i'm only getting paid half my wage so half an hour to do all this work, drain the ATF, drop the pan, clean both surfaces of RTV, reseal it, fill the pan, go back into the scan tool. There may be like a reflash or you, you may have to do some like programming for the trans. I'm only getting paid half an hour for all of this. So who cares? They're like, yeah, I'm only getting paid for half an hour for this, come on. But my point is under flat rate, I literally cannot do this job correctly because I need to get this car out as fast as possible. So again, if there was an excess RTV recall, yeah, the dealers wouldn't have time for all these cars for 24 hours of cure time. I mean, the car can't just sit on the rack and then, you know, all these cars sitting out in the parking lot with no oil waiting for the RTV to clean. That, that just would not happen, impossible. Okay, so if you made it this far, what an RTV recall would look like and why you don't want the dealership to do it. The biggest problem and exactly, probably the biggest reason I left the dealer, the flat rate system. The flat rate system means that I need to get this car in and out as fast as possible. Who cares if I do this job correctly or as should be done? Even if I'm doing a major invasive engine repair, such as removing the oil pan and cleaning the oil strainer of anything that blocks it or any debris under the flat rate system. Plus this is a warranty issue, so I'm getting paid half my wage. Why would you expect me to do a good job on this? Okay, I think, I think that's good enough. Okay, we'll cut it.